Okay, uh, so last time we finished the proof of the parameterization theorem, and then I quickly defined the height for uh, algebraic numbers. So I won't recall what it is, but we had this notation x e h. So e and h are integers, and it's the set of points on x whose degree over q is less than or equal to e. So the algebraic of bounded degree e, and their height is at most h. So if you don't want to think about general algebraic numbers, you can just take e to be one, and then this is just the rational points of height at most h. But the the advantage of the way I'm going to prove it is that you can do uh, algebraic numbers like all in the same step. The normal way of proving Peter Wilkie is an extra step to turn algebraic numbers of bounded degree. Okay, and then I finished by stating this. So this is what I'll call the Diophantine proposition. Um, so this is the thing that we're going to combine with the parameterization to prove Peter Wilkie. So what does it say? You've got four positive integers, k, n, e, and d. Uh, k is less than n, and d is big. Um, then there's some positive integer r and some c and epsilon, such that the following hold. If you have a, a parameterizing that phi, so it goes from i to k to i to the n, um, and it's a parameterizing map, so it's r times differentiable and has bounded derivatives up to order r, and you take its image, x, then for any h, the set we're interested in is contained in, at most, c times h to the epsilon, algebraic hypersurfaces of degree at most d. Uh, so what that means is zero sets of a single polynomial of degree at most d. Um, and then Importantly, this epsilon that the proposition gives us, as we increase d, epsilon goes to zero. So today I'm going to sketch a proof of this. Uh, and I need some notation. So, um, uh, so for, for d at least zero and n at least one, we'll put dn of d, it's going to be n plus d, choose n. So that's the number of uh, monomials in x1 up to xn of total degree at most d. Um, now, there's two, two ingredients for the, this proposition that I'm just going to state without proof. Um, so the first one is a, is a, a, a thing about heights. And it's a generalization of the following, which I, which is obvious. I don't need to prove it. So suppose, suppose Q in Q has height of most H. So what does that mean? That means it's A over B, where A and B are integers with um, absolute value at most H. And um, well, suppose also that Q is not zero. Then A is at least one, and B is an integer less than or equal to H. So the absolute value of Q is at least one over H. Um, and the following lemma is, is a generalization of this. Um, it's not as easy to prove. Uh, so I'm going to state it without proof. So what does it say? Um, Suppose I have Q in R to the N with degree at most E, height at most H, um, and I have a polynomial in X1 up to Xn. Uh, of degree d at most d. And suppose f of q is not zero, then um, f of q, his absolute value is at least one over this thing um, times the maximum of the coefficients, of the maximum of the absolute values of the coefficients of f, 
times h to the d to the n, d times n, all raised to the power e. Okay, so I'm not going to prove this, but it's proved in, in Habegger's paper that I referred to last time. Ah, I'll also put some references up, a PDF file of references at some point. Um, anyway, this is proved in Habegger's paper. It's a generalization of something called Louisville's inequality. If you've seen Heights before, you might have seen. Um, and what we're going to use it for, so what do we, in this, um, what do we want? We want to find polynomials, so that's hypersurfaces, which vanish at these points, right? And the way we're going to prove that they vanish at these points is by showing that they're smaller than this. And then this tells us that, that, that this doesn't hold, so that they vanish. Um, so this is quite a common trick in kind of transcendence theory. Um, uh, often you, or you have a situation which is a bit like the following. You, you know something, you want to show an integer is zero and you prove its modulus is less than one. Uh, so that it has to vanish because it's an integer. And these, these things are all generalizations of that idea. Um, okay, so that's one ingredient I'm gonna not prove. And then the other one, is the following. Uh, um, so I'll write it out. So I have uh, natural numbers with n less than or equal to n, and a is an m by n matrix uh, with rows. A1 up to AN uh, such that their Euclidean norms are at least uh, one. Um, and then I put delta to be the product of these Euclidean norms. And then um, what, the, what, what it's going to tell us is that there's a, there's a vector f of integers such that a times f is quite small or it's not too big. So f is going to be, the vector of integers is not too big and then a times f is going to be small. So let me write it out. So uh, then there exists, well, not too big. <laughs> F with uh, the maximum of the um, entries of F less than or equal to Q. Ah, sorry, I've forgotten something. Uh, I've got a Q. If Q is at least um, two times root N times delta to the one over N, then there exists f in z to the n minus zero with f less than or equal to q. I mean, the, not, um, the maximum of the absolute values of the coefficients of f, uh, the entries of f less than or equal to q, and uh, a times f uh, less than or equal to this two root n root n root n over m times q to the one minus n over m times delta to the one over m. Okay, so how are we going to use this? So f for us will identify um, polynomials with their coefficient vectors, and this is. This is how we're going to find the polynomials. So um, we'll see this in a minute. Uh, so this this lemma is it's a bit like something called Siegel's lemma. So Siegel's lemma gives you um, if you have a, a an, an integer matrix, uh, it gives you um, uh, an integer solution um, that's not too big. Uh, this doesn't do give you a solution. It gives you something that's a bit close to a solution, and um, how's it proved? It's proved using 
Minkowski's theorem in, in convex geometry. Uh, that's where the, that's where this, this comes from. You associate a lattice with the A, and then Minkowski's theorem tells you that there's a there's a lattice point that's not too big in a certain area. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Right. Let me state the the proposition that we'll prove, and then I'll prove what we want, the Diophantine proposition from it um, first, and then I'll sketch the proof of the proposition. So, proposition. Uh, so now I've got K, D, E, N, and B positive integers with K less than N uh, and B is relatively large. Uh, uh, I think that's a typo, that should be a B. Um, and um, then there's a C, with the following property. Uh, so the phi from i to the k. Oh, i is now the unit interval in the real. So I should have said that. <laughs> um, there's no minimal structures. On that. Phi maps i to the k to i to the n is c to the b plus one uh, with all its derivatives uh, at most one. For all alpha with uh, order at most b plus one and and x in i to the k um, and let x be the image then there is an n so n is less than or equal to c times h uh, so then for all h There is an n less than or equal to c times h to the k plus one n e b over b, uh, and there are polynomials f one up to f n not zero of degree at most d such that if q is in x e h so it's one of the points we're interested in then f i of q is zero for some i okay so this is quite close to what we want but there's now an extra parameter there's a b um, so first i'll prove what we want uh, so these are going to be the, the zero sets of these polynomials are going to be our hypersurfaces. Um, but we've got this B here. So proof of diaphragmatine. Proposition. From, from this proposition. So suppose in the diaphragmatine proposition, I have K, N, E, and D uh, with k less than n, d at least e plus one to the n. And I want to find um, r, c, and epsilon. Uh, well, um, so the function d uh, k of b is strictly increasing in b. Um, so there is a unique B such that uh, E plus one times DKB is less than or equal to DK plus one D strictly less than E plus one D 
dk b plus one. Um, so we fix that b. Um, and then, well, some computation. Uh, leads to, so using this bound here and this here, um, we get E plus one is bigger than D plus one over K plus one times D over B to the K. Um, and so, so that the computation comes from uh, writing these things out um, as factorials and staring at it. <laughs> and, uh, and so what do we get? D over B is less than uh, E plus one, K plus one over D plus one, all to the one over K. Um, so I'll turn the light on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so from this, we can see that this tends to uh, zero as d tends to infinity. Uh, because this goes to zero on this side. Um, so we then apply this proposition here with this choice of B. Um, and this here is our epsilon. Um, so we then take, we apply the proposition above, uh, put, put R to be B plus one, epsilon to be uh, K plus one, N E D over B, um, which now tends to zero because these are all fixed and this tends to zero. Okay, so that's how the, the, the I mean, the, the proposition we want really comes from this proposition just by choosing some parameters. Um, so now I'll sketch the proof of this proposition. Okay. Um, so proof of proposition. So sketch of proof of proposition. Right, um, so suppose H is at least one, and then C in C prime, et cetera, below are independent of H. Okay, so I'm gonna put R, so R is now for radius or something like that, uh, is C prime divided by H to the, K plus one over K times N E D over B, um, where C prime um, is small, and we'll choose it later. Um, so then my box I to the K is contained in, um, Uh, the union of n at most uh, one plus one over r to the k uh, boxes of side length r. Closed boxes And if you work this out, this is two to the K, C prime to the minus K, H to the K 
plus one uh, n. Sorry, this is less than or equal to uh, h to the k plus one n e d over b. Um, so this this is a c, um, and this is the boundary one on n. So now this n is going to be the n in the in the proposition. The number of polynomials we need. And it has a bound of this form. Okay, so we'll find um, a polynomial that works on each box. Um, so let V be such a box. Um, we find F equal to FV uh, such that f of q is zero for q, one of the points we're interested in, that's the image of a point in our v. Um, so q is in there, q is equal to phi of z for some z in v. Uh, I can see the set to phi to the k. Um, and then we do that for each v, and then we have our most n polynomials. We then vary v. You get f1 up to f1. Okay, so uh, so we want to find this f. So right. f like this. Uh, so it's a polynomial in x1 up to xn. Um, of degree at most d. Uh, so I can write it like this, where these coefficients fi in z uh, are to be determined. Um, and let's fix some point in, uh, in our closed box, our small box. Now for alpha in, uh, into the K with alpha, having order most b, let a alpha be the vector um, So it's r to the b minus uh, mod alpha divided by the norm of the vector d alpha phi i evaluated at a divided by alpha factorial, sorry, this is a vector, so i is uh, multi-index uh, in n to the n of order at most d, and I take the Euclidean norm, multiply that by d alpha phi i, so I perhaps shouldn't use alpha twice, but that's okay. Uh, oh no, I do want to, but sorry. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, where, uh, so phi is a map from i to the k to i to the n, and phi i is uh, phi 1 to the i1 times phi n to the i n. So it's like the monomial in the phi's. Um, so that gives us um, uh, a vector for each alpha. Uh, Multi index of order at most b, so we get n equal to d, so alpha's in n to the k, so we get dkb uh, rows, a alpha, and then how many columns? Well, we've got a column for each i, and n equal to dnd columns. Um, 
So we apply the matrix, we apply the lemma to this matrix. So for the lemma, we need um, we need to know delta and Q. Um, so a calculation shows that uh, we can take delta to be r to the minus p over k plus one d times k to the b. Um, we put Q to be R to the minus B um, plus K plus one divided by E plus one, K plus one. Where of course all these numbers appear out of the air. Right? They're chosen so that they work. <laughs> um, then we are in the setting of the number, so we can check that Q is at least two root N delta to the one over N, provided that the C prime that we, we put in the R at the beginning is sufficiently small, which we can assume it is. Okay, so by the lemma, there are Fi Or oh, there is, or oh, there are, I would say, uh, not all zero with uh, F, F not equal to Q, and uh, AF uh, less than or equal to C delta to the one over DKB divided by Q to the E. Now, uh, what is uh, AF? Let's copy this. So AF is equal to uh, this uh, with a sum there, F I there. So we get that this is less than or equal to this. And what we want to do now is, is show that this choice of F works. Okay, so, uh, so put um, G of Z equal to F of phi one of Z up to phi of Z. So we want to show if um, if Z is in a little box such that phi of Z is an outer right point of degree at most E and height at most H, um, then G of Z is zero. And so to that end, we're going to show that the modulus of G is small compared to the bound in the Louvre type lemma we had earlier. And we're going to do that by looking at the Taylor expansion of G. Um, so expand G as follows. So I've got my auxiliary point A that I've been working with, and I take the Taylor expansion around A. Uh, we have G of Z equals the sum over alpha of the sum over I. F I D alpha phi I A divided by alpha factorial times Z minus A to the alpha plus the remainder term where we have order B plus one. Um, So here, psi of z is some um, point on the line segment between a and z. Um, 
Okay, and now we we compute. <laughs> so uh, how much of this do I want to do? <laughs> so we're going to do the two terms, the two sums separately. So let's look at this one. So we have. When I look at this, uh, from this here, um, you see the, the um, Z minus A in our um, Taylor expansion, that's less than or equal to R because Z is in the box uh, and A is in the box and the box has side length at most R. So, uh, we're going to get this thing coming up onto the right. Um, so we get less than or equal to C times. So this is our bound on the um, on AF that we had. We get an R to the B uh, coming from these. And um, because we've got an alpha here and we had a B minus alpha in the up here. Um, and then we get the sum of the uh, Euclidean norms. Um, now, these are all small because of our bound on derivatives. Um, and so this comes out as less than. Uh, C. Uh, okay, I'm just, we're going to write C R to the sigma, where because these are both defined in terms of R, and so sigma is this. And then we need to estimate the remainder as well. Um, so for the remainder, uh, we get the same bound. So we get the remainder less than or equal to, well, we have a norm, um, sorry, uh, yes, no. Just that's what my norm is. Uh, so that's coming from uh, all of these. The constant is coming from these because these are all bounded. And then we get an R to the B plus one at the end because of this. Uh, but these Fs, they're all less than or equal to Q. Um, and then if you work it out, of course, it's all chosen so that when you put the Q in there, that's less than or equal to CQ uh, R to the B plus one. And then working out Q, you get this. Okay, so what does that tell us? Um, so we get And that G of Z is with a different choice of C, C R to the sigma. Okay, now suppose um, Q equal to phi of Z and Z in V. So Q is a, an algebraic point degree at most E and height at most H, and it's the image of a point in our box. Well, if um, f of q is not zero, so we want we want f of q to be zero. If it's not, then by the the lemma that we had about heights, so the Liouville lemma, um, it's bounded below by something like this. 
so it was the um, norm of f, which is q, and then the height of it dn all to the power e. So this is so q. Um, and then, uh, so this is this is g of z. So we get c r to the sigma is bigger than this. Um, Um, and you rearrange what you get. Uh, <laughs> it's um, C, so uh, R to the sigma, Q to the E, H to the D, N, E is at least one over C, D, N, D. Now, if you work this out, this, by the choices we've made, this is C prime to the BK over K plus one. Um, so now I've got this is at least this, but here there's nothing depending on H. So now if this is positive, the exponent, so if I just make this sufficiently small, then this equality can't be true. Um, so making or choosing C prime sufficiently small, we get a contradiction. So that F of Q is zero, um, which is what we wanted. So that this F does vanish at all the points we need it to. And then we vary over all the boxes to get all the Fs in the proposition. Okay, so that was probably too fast if you've never seen such a thing before. Um, I'm sorry, uh, but, but well, if you didn't follow it, you can, like Habegger's paper is quite nice to read, so. <laughs> um, but it gives you at least some idea. The, the way these proofs work, you want to show that, you, you, you want to find some polynomials which vanish at certain rational points. Um, and the way you do that is by showing that they're small, and then if they didn't vanish, they'd have to be big at rational points. And because they're small, they must vanish at those points. And kind of, Everything else is setting it up so that that works. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So that's that's the a, a quick proof of the Diophantine part. So now we've proved dramatization. We've proved the Diophantine part. So we probably don't have time to prove Peter Wilkie today. <laughs> um, but I'll state it at least. So previously, I've only stated it. Um, for a single definable set, for the proof, we actually need it for families. So you get a version for families and you need to do that to make the proof work. Um, okay, so Peter Wilkie. Um, so now I suppose R tilde is over. Okay, so what are we going to prove? Theorem, so this is the Peter Wilkie theorem. Suppose X, so it's no longer just a, a set definable in R to the N, it's a family. Uh, and um, the constant is uniform in the family. So, and I have E, Natural number, um, epsilon at least zero. Well, sorry, bigger than zero. Then there is uh, C, um, such that for all parameters, so for all 
a in r to the n and all h, we have, when I look at the fiber over a, and I take its transcendental part, and I look at the points of degree at most e and height at most h, there's at most c h to the epsilon of them. So this is uh, an upgrade in two ways on what I stated last week. Uh, the first is it's got it's for families, and the second is that I'm now counting points of bounded degree rather than just rational points. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not going to give Peel and Wilkie's proof. I'm going to follow uh, the proof by Bardwaj and Vandenpries, uh, which Nia spoke about in the seminar on Tuesday. Um, Um, and they have a very nice paper on the topic um, in which you can read the original proof of the Diophantine part of the proposition and the original proof of parameterization rather than the proofs I've given. Um, but then, and the new bit of their paper is the way that they use those to prove this. And that's what we'll follow. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, so the, the key demo in their proof is really easy, uh, but it's the very important observation. It's what makes their proof work. So suppose S in R to the N is semi algebraic. So that means definable just in the real field. Um, R. My omen wall structure expands the real field. Um, sorry, that's important. Um, okay, suppose S is semi algebraic and I have a map from S to some Rn, which is semi algebraic and injective. Uh, now, suppose I take a set in S such that when I restrict F to X, it's a homeomorphism onto its image. Um, so if X is such that F restricted to X from X to Y, which is just F of X, is a homeomorphism, Then when I take f of the algebraic part of x, I get the algebraic part of y. And so when I take f of the transcendental part of x, I get the transcendental part of y. Then uh, f of x alg is equal to y alg. And so f of x trans is equal to y trans. So remember that the algebraic part of X is the union of all connected infinite semi-algebraic subsets of X. Okay, so proof. So it's clear that, that when I take X alg under F and contained in Y alg, Uh, so let's go the other way. Suppose we have C in Y, a connected infinite semi algebraic set. Well, then, okay, so F is invertible on Y. Uh, so I look at F inverse of C. That's um, semi algebraic because F is semi algebraic and C is semi algebraic. It's contained in X um, because F is injective. Uh, 
Um, and it's connected because C is connected and F is continuous and it's infinite by injectivity. Uh, so it's contained in an algebraic part of X. So when I take F inverse of the algebraic part of Y, I end up in the algebraic part of X, hence F of the algebraic part of X is equal to the algebraic part of Y. So F inverse of Y alge contained in X alge and um, F of X alge is equal to alge. Okay, and at this point, I was going to start the proof of Peter Wilkie, but I have three minutes left, which is not enough time to do the proof. Uh, perhaps I'll do, because I can just copy this to the start of the next, I'll do one reduction. So proof, I will start the proof. So, so the proof is by induction on it, right? That's the the dimension, the ambient dimension of the fiber space. Um, so by induction on M. Now, um, the reduction I'm going to do now is just to show that we can assume all our fibers, rather than being subsets of R to the N, are actually subsets of I to the N. Um, so how do we do that? We look at the map that sends X like a real number, uh, to uh, plus or minus x to the plus or minus one um, using the maps so x maps to plus or minus x to the plus or minus one we can move um, everything we can just take images of x under those maps to move things into the box and these maps they preserve being algebraic of degree at most e and height for most h um, so using the maps there which preserve um, points of degree at most e height at most h uh, we can assume XA is actually contained in 0, 1 to the N. But then I can handle the faces of the box by induction. And so using uh, induction, that XA is contained in I to the N. So this is for each A. Um, so that means we're in a position to use the parameterization result we had. Okay, so I'll finish the proof next time. And then what we're gonna do next week after that, we'll do applications of this. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's what we'll do. Thank you, Gareth. Stop the recording. <laughs>